Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you all. This is your host, Amina Ahmed, and you're watching Muslim Network TV. Welcome back to another episode of Next Gen. Next Gen is a platform that hopes to amplify the voices of young people. Young people who are generally not given a platform, a spotlight by mainstream media. We're there on Galaxy 19, Satellite, MuslimNetwork.tv, Amazon Fire TV, Roku, and soon on Apple TV as well. Now, today we have with us a phenomenal guest, a, a, someone who does work for our community, for people outside of our community, who's just extremely involved, and, and it's an absolute honor to have him on our show. We have Senator Mujtaba Muhammad, who's representing 38th District in the North Carolina State Senate. He's a former staff attorney and child advocate of the Council of Children's Rights and a and a fighter for indigent people as an assistant public defender. Senator Mushtaba Muhammad's family hails originally from Hyderabad, India. So phenomenal to see a Muslim, to see a fellow Hyderabadi, someone from our community going out there and making some changes. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum and hello, uh, Amina, and hello to all your viewers. Thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, thank you. And, and thank you for the work that you do. Uh, Senator, before we get into some of those actual policies and all of that, you know, good stuff, tell us about what inspired you to, to do the work that you do. What inspired your journey? I mean, it depends on what type of work you're, you want to talk about. I mean, uh, look, for me, um, I'll tell you, a lot of folks ask, like, where do you get this passion from? And for me, it really comes down to our faith and our cultural background at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, as an Indian American, you know, as a Muslim American, that we're taught always that it's never about us, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's all about your family. It's always about a team, right? It's never about the individual. Um, and also, we know from the message of Allah that um, you should want for your brothers and sisters what you want for yourself. And that's kind of also always been my guiding principle. It's why I decided to be a public interest lawyer. So all I've ever done my entire life representing children and underserved families as a staff attorney at the Council for Children's Rights for a number of years. And I'm still currently uh, representing indigent folks as a trial attorney at the Public Defender's Office here in Charlotte, North Carolina. And doing that type of work when you're dealing with people's day-to-day -day challenges. And I see day in and day out uh, that people don't know where they're going to put their head at night. Uh, when their next meal's coming, how are they going to get to and from work tomorrow? I mean, these real issues that so many times you and I and so many other folks take for granted every single day, uh, those are significant issues and challenges for everybody's day in and day out life. And for me, I believe that uh, what, what kind of motivated me to run for public office was, was at the end of the day, I don't necessarily believe in a big government or a small government. I believe in a better government, uh, a government that effectively works for people. And when I am as, a, as an attorney, and I know, I mean, you're, I'm so excited to hear that you one day want to yeah. be, uh, be a criminal defense attorney. That's so exciting to hear because we need a diversity in careers for our young people. But the reality is when you're standing as an attorney next to somebody in an orange jumpsuit to your right in front of a judge or a jury or, or what have you, um, we as a society have given up on those individuals. We have utterly failed them as people. And I believe my faith and what my parents have taught me is we've got to do better. Uh, it's why I decided to run for public office. Not only that, I mean, you know the challenges that we live in currently, um, where folks are genuinely talking about how Muslims can't be trusted in public office. You heard that from our president. You heard that from folks like now our HUD secretary, Ben Carson. Uh, that's absolutely frightening. Uh, Muslim Americans have been in this country for decades and hundreds and hundreds of years. We were part of the Revolutionary War. We participated in the Civil War. We've been a part of this American fabric, and we too have things to bring as far as solutions to the table. Um, so as a young Muslim American, not only am I the highest ranking Muslim elected official in the state of North Carolina, I'm also the youngest elected state senator in, in yeah. North Carolina. So I, I, I'm, I'm excited to see more people of color more people of diverse backgrounds stepping up and joining the political process because a lot of our experiences need to be heard and we can provide a lot of solutions to the problems of the day. Absolutely amazing, uh, Senator. But, you know, in our community, we do hear a lot of noise, but not a lot of action. And I think now with, with the younger generation, you, you said you were the youngest and we are seeing that changing uh, now. But why 38th District? 
So Senate District 38 is where I've grown up. Look, I was born in Ohio. I grew up in the Carolinas. I moved to uh, Greenville, South Carolina. I was three years old. Been in Charlotte, North Carolina since I was in high school. Uh, grew up in this area. I'm a proud product of Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, the UNC system. Uh, public education has been a strong foundation for me, uh, not only to advocate for myself and my family and my children now, uh, but also for so many folks in the community. Um, just love this community. Uh, we've got so many great things. We're headquartered. Bank of America, if you know, is headquartered in Charlotte, North Carolina. We've got a huge Wells Fargo um, um, division here in Charlotte, North Carolina. But it's a phenomenal city. It's a phenomenal town. Uh, people doing great things. There's a lot of diversity. And Charlotte is the biggest city in North Carolina. We've got about a, a, a million people in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I'm raising my family here. Uh, and I'm going to be part of, uh, of providing a lot of solutions to people's problems. So I'm proud to represent the good people of Charlotte Mecklenburg in the North Carolina Senate day in and day out. And I'm sure they're proud to have someone like you represent them. Uh, Senator, we spoke a little bit about your identities and how your faith and your culture has inspired you. Uh, but tell us more about how that shaped your experience, not only in Senate, but outside of it as well. Look, again, that, that's absolutely right. right. This is how Muslim Americans, this is how we can combat the Islamophobia. This is how we combat the bigotry and the hate that we deal with oftentimes. The reality is so many times as Muslim Americans, we're so reclusive and we want to stay to ourselves. You know, we want to go to our weekend biryani parties, maybe not during COVID, right? We want to hang out with our own social circles. When we go to the masjid, unfortunately, the mosques, we hang out with people that look like us. And that's unfortunate because that's not what our faith represents. So my faith, again, teaches me that I've got to want for other children what I want for my own children. So I've been a strong proponent of making sure we have a strong public education system in North Carolina. A lot of elected officials brag about being 39th and 41st when it comes to teacher pay. That's shameful. How oftentimes I'm going to do you hear sports teams bragging about being ranked 39th. So why mm -hmm. the heck should we do that when it comes to things like teacher pay or per people spending? These are genuine issues. And when we come from a, a Desi background, Indian, Pakistani, Bengali, Southeast Asian, you know how much we value education, right? Education is the biggest fundamental game changer. And the greatest thing about America, it's not about where you're coming from. It's about what you're doing today, what you're going to do tomorrow that determines your success, right? So you can leave a lot of that cultural baggage in India, Pakistan, or wherever you come from. Um, when you're here in America, you have an opportunity. And education for me is the absolute biggest game changer for young people because so oftentimes a zip code determines a child's trajectory in future when that's not what it's supposed to be. It should determine where your mail goes, mm -hmm. not where your future is. So. Uh, Things like education, you know, protecting and caring for our environment. These are uh, values that guide our faith, right? We should all have clean air and clean water. Forgiveness, you know, how often do we talk about as Muslim Americans that uh, if God can, can forgive, and who are we not to give forgive? So we've got to take a really good look at when it comes to justice reform. I mean, how many more times do we need to hear, I can't breathe, please mm -hmm. don't kill me? from another unarmed black man in this country. And as Muslim Americans, we need to be standing shoulder to shoulder with our black brothers and sisters in, the, in, in justice reform. We can't just specifically care about what's happening back home uh, where our countries, where our parents or grandparents came from. We're here, we're growing up here, we're raising our children here. So we've gotta be part of those solutions. Uh, and we bring those experiences to it. And I'm so proud to have sponsored over 155 bills since I've been in the North Carolina Senate. Uh, a couple of them have passed. I'm in the minority party. Uh, and that's tough just because you have a D next to your label. Uh, the majority party will oftentimes kill your bill and, and they go into the rules committee where the bills go to die. Uh, but we're still championing those bills. We use our bully pulpit to do that. Not only that, we're recruiting amazing candidates in North Carolina to flip the North Carolina Senate. I mean, I'm excited to tell you, we're four seats shy of taking the majority in North Carolina. Amen. And when we do do that, in about, what, 77 days before election day, I think, uh, I, think I think I'm right, about 77, 76 days, uh, you're gonna see a lot of change coming back to North Carolina uh, when it comes to education, when it comes to justice reform, when it comes to uh, protecting women's rights, equal pay for equal work, the Equals Rights Amendment. I mean, these are all Islamic values. And I'm proud to champion those values in the North Carolina Senate and to be able to create our own narrative, to not let the, 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 the Fox News or, or, or right wingers or even folks that are completely out of, out of touch with our faith, uh, that don't know anything about it, that have only heard small tidbits, who have seen it sensationalized in Hollywood or Bollywood. I'm not going to let those individuals 
dictate who I am, who my faith is, but I'm going to roll up my sleeves and get to work for people that may not look like me or my family, but have the same needs as my family and I. And, and Senator, I think it's evident that you're fighting the right fight here, but I'm sure it hasn't been and it's not going to be an easy road. But tell me about some of the challenges that you're facing currently that you have faced in this road, in this journey uh, with all of the work that you do. Look, uh, the most incredibly challenge as a legislator is at the end of the day, um, you have to be a very good listener. You have to be able to analyze mm -hmm. and you have to be able, able to build relationships. So that's one of the great things about being a lawyer and serving in the legislature, because you have to be able to think about both sides of the issue. Right. So when I'm a Democrat, but what I do, the reality is have to work with the majority party in our state, which is the Republicans. So we've been able to make uh, uh, I'm such a proud I'm a proud sponsor of bills like the Second Chance Act, for example, in our state, which will now automatically expunge folks criminal records, especially when their cases have been dismissed by a prosecutor or they've been dismissed at a bench trial or a jury trial, because those charges even have dramatic collateral consequences on folks's livelihood because now this determines if you're going to get a job if you're going to be able to keep your housing so we've been able to talk about these types of issues um, in an important way for me they're social justice they're moral issues but when i talk to my republican counterparts i have to pitch it to them as a jobs issue as an economic mm -hmm. issue right because it just yeah. depends on how people think and you've got to at the end of the day be a fighter for the people that sent you to represent them. Uh, so you've got to do what you, what you got to do. And you got to have these hard conversations with folks. And the reality is, as elected officials, I've come to realize more and more, um, at the end of the day, whether you're a Republican, Democrat, or independent, I truly genuinely believe you have the best intentions for your country, for your city, and your county, or your state. Um, you might just have a different way of thinking of things. So it's important to be able to listen to each other and have a conversation which I think too often we don't do enough in this country. And, and it's amazing that you're working across the aisle with people that you might not necessarily agree with, right? Um, but Senator, you know, what has the main response of, of the public, of, of your constituents, of, of your district been, you know, has it been positive or constructive? Tell us about that. Well, I'm running for my second term right now. I'm up for in, North, in the state of North Carolina. We have two year terms in the North Carolina House and Senate. So I'm running for my, I'm running for re-election. So I'm back on the ballot. Uh, it's my first presidential election that I'm going to be able to see my ballot. So that's kind of surreal. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you, when I ran uh, in, in, in 2017 is when I geared up to run. 2018 was when my election occurred. And I'll tell you, because of the issues that we talked about um, and some advice to the young people that are listening today, it's not enough just to talk about these issues. you gotta put, you got to do the work. Because the reality is when you look like me and you, Amina, not a lot of folks are necessarily going to believe us. Or, or, or necessarily count on us to have their back. So being able to say that I've, that I've been in those courtrooms with those young children, that I've been able to advocate as a, almost like a social worker for the folks that need uh, mental health assistance or, or substance abuse assistance or housing assistance, uh, my work has been able to be uh, provide the proof of the, the type of work that I want to do in the North Carolina Senate, working at the Council for Children's Rights, being a public interest attorney, doing this well before I even thought about running for public office. Um, so th that type of work tells folks how sincere you are. So whenever folks say, hey, that's Senator Muhammad. Uh, he doesn't worship like us. He doesn't look like us. We can't trust that guy. That's not true because people have gotten to know you in the community. They know that you stand for equity. They know you stand for justice. They know you stand for the truth. They know that you stand for a state and a country working for everyone, regardless of their economic background or the way they look or their gender identity. So what I will tell you when I was running, alhamdulillah, I was able to get every major endorsement from organizations like the Black Political Caucus, from our Latinx communities, from our social workers, from our educators, uh, because of the real issues we talked about. We took on a three-term incumbent and we won. And I'll tell you, oftentimes it's our own community that doesn't have the faith mm -hmm. in us. But we've got to show them otherwise, because back here, you see probably my, my, my campaign logo. I can't tell you how many people, even within our community, I'm in a, said, look, you can't have Muhammad for North Carolina. Why not? Why not? Right. It's the world's most common name. And, mm -hmm. and I have it. Uh, and I'm proud of my name. I'm proud of who I am. Um, I'm not only am I a Muslim American, but of course, I'm an Indian American. I'm a father. I'm a husband. I'm a son. I'm a child of immigrant parents. We bring so many characteristics to the table as far as who we are. And if folks think that you are going to be their champion at the end of the day, they'll support you no matter what they hear from others. 
it's so nice to say Senator and then say such an obviously Muslim name. So amazing. You know, and you know, I keep saying it, Senator Mushtaba Muhammad. Such yeah. it's evident that you know you're Muslim um, and and just your identity is so evident from your name and it's true, why not? And then we'll be speaking more about the work that you do and your advice to, to young people right after our short break. We're there on Galaxy 19 Satellite, Muslim Network TV, Amazon Fire TV, Roku, and soon on Apple TV as well. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Next Gen. I'm here with Senator Mujtaba Muhammad. Now, Senator, what would you say to young people, young people who have become disillusioned, um, who have lost faith in the system, especially with the current climate that we're seeing today? I know a lot of young people personally who, who don't feel secure in this country, who don't uh, have hope in the systems in this country as well. What do you say to young people like that? I'm going to tell you, well, if you don't do anything bad, nothing's going to change. So if you're that upset and you're that disappointed about it, that's what I was about, right? I That's what I incredibly, as an assistant public defender working in public interest law, for example, I felt oftentimes, yes, I was fighting for people's constitutional rights, but I felt like I'm putting a band-aid on people's problems. I mean, the criminal justice system quickly just just literally chews people up and, and spits them out and chews them back up and spits them back out. Uh, and we've got to do a better job of providing different types of solutions and advocacy for people. So if you're upset about whatever it is, uh, if you're upset about our, our economy, if you're upset about our environmental issues, if you're worried about justice reform issues, if you're worried about women's rights issues, if you're worried about Islamophobia and bigotry, what are you doing about it, right? At the same, uh, for me, it's not enough just to post on social media, right? There's different types of advocacy. Yes, you can post on social media, do it, right? It's mm -hmm. not always just enough just to protest, do it. But you've got to be able to reach out to the decision makers. And, and, and the reality is oftentimes so many folks wait on places like Washington, D.C. or Raleigh, where I serve in the North Carolina Senate, to provide solutions for, for the problems of the day. But the reality is so many solutions to the problems that we deal with the day in and day out. Those, those issues are being determined today in your school board meetings, in your county commissions, in your city councils, in your PTA meetings, in your neighborhood association meetings. I mean, that is the building block of democracy. So you've got to participate. you got to get engaged. And at the bare minimum, you got to get involved and vote. It's not enough just to vote for a Democrat or a Republican. You've got to be able to do a little bit of your research because there's different flavors of Democrats. There's different flavors of Republicans. Yeah. So you've got to figure out who aligns with your values. And then once you do that, you've also be, got to be able to support amazing qualified candidates. You know, I mean, I, I hope that one day when you're practicing law and you decided to serve in public office, you or your friends, that you that you do that. Your voice is much needed. But at the end of the day, we've got to have people in our community, people that don't look like us and people that do look like us, people that don't pray like us, people that do pray like us. They've got to be able to have our back. And that means supporting us, supporting our campaigns financially, right? Individuals like me um, tr avoid corporate PAC money, right? At the end of the day, if you want your voice to be heard, then individuals have to support politicians and public servants and elected officials to make sure that their voice is heard. In America, the reality is campaign contributions, if, you, if you're not raising money, it's, you can't communicate your message of equity and justice and things that you're working on. So you've got to be able to communicate. It's almost like literally your car running out of gas. 
if you don't fundraise. So it's important to support qualified, amazing candidates in your community. Um, again, it doesn't have to be thousands of dollars, hundreds of dollars. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Commit to it. Volunteering for them, phone banking for them, knocking on doors for them. Figure out where you fit. And most importantly, I would tell folks, figure out how the sausage is made, right? No offense, because, right, we don't eat pork. But my point is, you got to figure out how the things are done. Figure out how budgets are written. Have you ever looked at a budget? What are the issues in your community, right? So many folks are quick to worry about every four year elections for president of the United States. Well, what's happening in your local school board, right? What's happening in your neighborhood? What's happening in your city council? Uh, how much power does our city council have over law enforcement? That's something right there if you're so committed about criminal justice reform. So if you got to figure out how government works, figure out what your role is. Otherwise, the problems that you are complaining about are never going to be solved. They're going to continue. And the reality is the key players want you to be distracted. They want you to stay busy with your TV shows and your reality TV shows and your movies and your entertainment and your music and your TikToking and whatever you do. Do it. But at the same time, be woke. Uh, and, and look out for one another in our community. Yeah, I, I think that is some advice that everyone can take, right? Be woke and actually do something with that wokeness. I think a lot of, a lot of what we see today, especially with young people, is just they, they think being woke is enough, right? You just sit down and be woke and, and that's it. And it's like, good for you, but you got to do more than just complain, more than just um, complain about the situation that our country is in currently. Uh, but Senator, I want to hear more about the policies that you've implemented to better the lives of the constituents of your district. I know there's a lot of them, but just, uh, you know, just some of them that have really impacted, uh, you know, and bettered the lives of, of the people in your district. Look, uh, look, we just talked about wokeness. A, a good leader, a genuine leader, listens and he acts. He just doesn't call people out or she doesn't call people out. So um, when, when we're talking about some of the things we worked on, that requires action. So some of the things we've been able to work out, work on that I'm so proud of just this past session in June, we passed the Second Chance Act, like I mentioned earlier, is genuine criminal justice reform at our state level. No individual should have to spend hundreds and thousands of dollars in hiring a lawyer to, cl to clean up their life. So opportunities like automatic expungements, those are game changers in people's lives. I'm so proud to be able to sponsor legislation like making sure we have universal pre-K for every single child. Education has changed. The reality is, look, when I was growing up, I went to kindergarten. That was it. But education has changed. And not everybody has the same parents, doesn't have the same guardians, doesn't have the same type of adults who are supporting them and nourishing them and enriching them with that educational opportunity. So early childhood education is a game changer for so many children that wouldn't otherwise have it. And the reality is the cost of education for early childhood education keeps so many families out of it. So working on those types of things, when it comes to making sure we are doing more of things like have an economy that works for all of us, right? The earned income tax credit is, is something in North Carolina that we got rid of for whatever reason. In our state, we have one of the lowest corporate taxes in the country at two and a half percent. And we've shifted the tax burden on so many working families, whether it's increasing court fees and fines, whether it is increasing their personal income taxes, whether it's getting rid of things like the earned income tax credit. I mean, having a couple hundred dollars in your uh, as a credit to you determines if you can make your next car payment, if you can make your next rental payment. So those are the types of, of pieces of legislation we've been able to champion. Uh, we're also championing common sense gun reform. Right. Um, I believe in, in, in the Second Amendment. Right. Nobody at the end of the day is trying to take your gun away. But the mm -hmm. reality is, if you are a danger to self or others, law enforcement, medical professionals should be able to petition a judge um, to take your take your weapon away. So those are the types of legislations that we've, we've been kind of working on and have been moving forward. Medicaid expansion is a huge issue for our state of North Carolina. We've got at least a million people uninsured. And I know for the fellow Daisies and Muslim Americans out here listening today, you know, many of y'all have doctors in your family. I mean, how important is health care? But the reality is so many of our friends and neighbors don't even have access to preventative care. And that's disheartening in the year 2020. People don't have access to that. So I've been a huge proponent of Medicaid expansion. I was one of the first sponsors of it when I first came to the North Carolina Senate in 2019. Unfortunately, our, our Republican legislature wants nothing to do with Medicaid expansion. And primarily because there was a black man in the White House named Barack Obama who championed the Affordable Care Act. And they want nothing to do with his legacy. And they're <laughs> playing politics with it. They would rather let folks in their rural parts of our state 
die and suffer for, without having access to health care and actually expand access to health care. For so many, of, so many states that have expanded, 90% of that cost is already covered by your federal taxes. Many of us are already paying for it. And I believe Illinois is a state that has expanded Medicaid, but states like North Carolina haven't. So my tax dollars are going to the state of Illinois where my friends and neighbors don't even live. Right. I have a couple of friends there like you, Amina, but 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 there's so many co-workers and folks that could benefit from that type of legislation to be able to see a doctor um, is, is so, so important. So I'm so proud to be able to champion pieces of legislation like that. We're going to continue to do this work when it comes to unemployment. That's another critical issue. We've seen millions unemployed as this as this epidemic has been a global phenomenon across our country and across the world. Uh, and the reality is folks are hurting right now. In our state legislation, the federal government needs to step up and do more about it to make sure that folks can pay their bills so they don't get evicted. Uh, looking at voting rights, it's a fundamental issue. I believe that we should encourage voting, right? I mean, that's the fundamental foundation of our democracy. So things like automatic voter registration, mail-in voting, make it safe and secure, but especially as we're dealing with this global pandemic, uh, those are important issues because it's our senior citizens who are working the polls. God knows what's going to happen come election day. We're going to see real voter suppression across the country because some states have failed to make sure that our elections are safe, secure, and that folks can make their voices heard. But that's what they want. They want you to be distracted. They don't want you to vote. So these are some of the issues that we've been able to work on and champion. We've made some, made, we've made some progress, but we've got to take the majority in 2020 to make sure we see them through. And Senator, you're running for re-election. I'm so glad to hear that you're running for re-election because like you said, you, you have made a lot of progress, but there's still a lot of work left to do. And before we end here, Senator, I just want to take your advice to young people who want to get involved into politics, who want to you know, take the non-traditional route of medicine and perhaps go somewhere else. And, and what is your advice to them? Look, we do it. I have more power to you if you want to be a doctor and engineer. The day I was born, I swear my parents told me I had to be a doctor and engineer. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I didn't become a doctor and engineer. I ended up becoming a lawyer. But look, the reality is we, we are the ones who need to write our own narrative. And the more we diversify, just like in anything else, that's how we win. So we need more lawyers. We need more uh, journalists. Right. We need more public policy experts. We need folks that are comedian, comedians like Hassan Minhaj. Like, look at the amazing work he's been able to do just on Netflix and The Daily Show. More and more people have become a little bit more comfortable with Muslims and brown men just through his basic comedy and being able to talk real issues with real people. So these are some basic fundamental gains that we've been able to make. So we've got to diversify to in order to write our own narrative and only you can do it. So I would urge you to do it. I would encourage anyone and anyone listening, get involved with any political campaign that you care about. If you don't want to work on a campaign, reach out to a current elected official and see how government works and understand it because you are our future leaders. Uh, we are who we're waiting on at the end of the day. So thank you, Amina. Thank you so much. We do need to be writing our own narratives and hopefully we see that now with my generation as well. Thank you so much, Senator, for being with us. Thank you to our audience for watching and take care until next week. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you all.